Good morning. Uh, it's really great to be here uh, on this wintry uh, April morning here in Boston. Um, I wanted to uh, sort of talk today about the role pharma can play in the health information technology space. Um, it's not entirely obvious. I think sometimes it feels like a forced fit to people. Um, and I wanted to kind of tell you a little bit about the Merck story in this space. Um, but before I do that, I want to just sort of give you uh, some, some of my broad views of the healthcare information technology landscape. So this is a quote from Todd Park that I refer to uh, pretty frequently, which is that there's never been a, be a better time to be an innovator in healthcare. And I used to have the fortune of being at senior staff meetings with, with Todd when I was at ONC. And um, he would always say this, and I would look at him like he was crazy, because it felt like we were in the midst of this sort of uh, total chaotic time. And um, it didn't really feel like the best time to me uh, to be a, a, an innovator in healthcare. But when I reflect on what's really going on across the landscape, when I think about everything that's going on, when I think about this room and the fact that if we had a conference like this 10 or 15 years ago, there'd be five people here, um, it really does feel like a special time. It does feel like the best time to be uh, an innovator in healthcare. And let me say a couple of reasons why. So, you know, for one, you have Ob Obamacare, and, um, you know, to quote the vice president, it's a BFD. Um, and uh, you also have the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is actually changing how we pay for care uh, for the very first time. I think, you know, for years, people took as static the payment models, and, you know, payment drives delivery, and if, if payment is static, then delivery is static. And all of a sudden, you have these new models of care that are being introduced, the opportunity to actually scale medical homes and accountable care organizations and bundled payments and all these things that were really, frankly, science fiction in the pages of, of health policy journals like health affairs, um, you end up actually creating all kinds of new opportunity from the chaos that, that I was referencing. And then finally, you have the High Tech Act. And so you have this trifecta of activity, meaningful use, uh, Obamacare, the expansion of coverage, and then finally, payment and delivery innovation, which I think is actually creating a perfect storm of opportunity for those of us who are interested in, in healthcare delivery and changing it. I think we also just have more and better people. I talked about the folks in this room um, but the, you know, the, the reality is, is that there's all kinds of new voices in the healthcare delivery reform conversation. When I thought about a career in healthcare policy 10, 15 years ago, and I looked at, I did a retrospective of people who were active in the field 10 years before that and 20 years before that, it was all the same people. It was all the same names, all saying the exact same things, sort of year after year, decade after decade. And all of a sudden, we have all kinds of new voices. You have hackathons, you have accelerators, you have entrepreneurs that are just coming out of the woodworks to say, I have a solution to actually change this problem or that problem. And you've got patients in the room for the first time in a really authentic way. And so it just feels like a very, very exciting time. And I think Todd's words really, really do ring true. Um, and then I think that finally we have a clear sense of what the problems are. You know, it wasn't so long ago that you'd go to a, a room of sort of, you know, you'd go to the American College of Physicians in 2000 and people would assume that quality was good. Uh, people assumed that the system that we had was a good system and that we really just needed to work on sustainability. And I think finally, we're starting to operate from a common framework in terms of what the problems are. And so you have articles like this, you know, the Stephen Brill article in, in Time Magazine, uh, you know, that was one of the most downloaded articles over the last you know, decade uh, for Time. Um, you have you know, David Goldhill's article in, in, in The Atlantic. And so finally, people are starting to recognize we have problems in access, and we have problems in quality, and we have problems in the meaningful use of health information technology. Um, payment doesn't really work. Qual you know, quality uh, measurement remains a, a major issue. You have a, a, a fragmented market for healthcare delivery that really prevents us from actually introducing meaningful change. And so finally, you have you know, the policy levers to actually make a difference, the health information technology infrastructure to actually measure and improve care. You've got new and better talent in the room. And then you've got, finally, a common set of problems that we can all agree on. Before it was, is this a problem? Is that a problem? We actually now all agree. And I think it all leads up to what I think is just a very, very special moment in the history of American healthcare. And you know, the, the, the exciting thing is that I think we're starting to actually get the patient voice in the room. Um, and that's because many of us are becoming patients, or many of us have family members who are patients, and we start to actually 
bring those experiences into the conversation in ways that we never did before. I, you know, I, I want to tell the story of a patient I took care of in the, oper in the, in the emergency room of the Brigham. Um, this was someone who you know, seemed very familiar to me when I met them. Um, I didn't really understand why when I first you know, in, encountered her. It was you know, probably 11 p.m. on a Friday night. Um, I said, do I know you from somewhere? She said, I actually work here. And I said, I don't think I've ever seen you before. She said, I'm actually the operator uh, you know, who answers the phone sometimes here. And I would always talk to the operator in the morning to sign my pager in. So she'd probably sign my pager in a thousand times over the previous three years. And the amazing thing uh, about this woman is, I, I immediately recognized it, is that she was in trouble. Um, her blood pressure was 190 over 100. Um, she had horrible back pain. And I couldn't really figure out what was going on with her. Um, she seemed to be on all the right medications. And ultimately, um, you know, she really needed to be admitted to the hospital. When I started to dig deeper into her case, um, what I recognized was, yes, she had the same health insurance that I did. Yes, she was an employee at a prestigious Boston teaching hospital. But no, she wasn't actually taking her medications as directed. But I, as a clinician, I felt incredibly powerless in that moment because I actually didn't have the information to know that she actually didn't take that medication. Um, the information flows from, the, uh, from uh, her pharmacy never made its, made, made its way back to the electronic medical record. And sort of this very weird irony, her primary care physician was Will Schrank, who's one of the world's leading adherence experts. And so we're sitting there, you know, Will and I, and we're starting to wonder, how can we actually change the story? And the answer for us was, frankly, health information technology. So when we sit in a, inside a pharmaceutical company, we start to think about the role that information technology can play in actually improving healthcare and improving the use of our medications, we think about the ways in which information technology drives the patient experience of the medication and drives the clinician's experience of actually prescribing that medication. So I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the three or four ways that we're thinking about this at Merck. I do want to say that within all this activity, I really do feel like you know, we're in the Wild West. And sometimes people ask me um, within the company and, and externally, you know, what keeps me up at night? And what keeps me up at night is this notion that activity doesn't equal achievement. You're all here in this room. We're all starting new companies. We're all working together. We're all launching and, you know, these collaborations. But I always sort of have this like nagging suspicion that we're not really making a difference. And I, I want to ask you all to kind of hold that sort of high level of skepticism and that high level of ambition, frankly, for this moment. Because I, I do worry that this is a moment that could easily get lost. All the new money that's coming into health information technology, all the new ventures that people are creating may not make a lick of a difference um, for a couple of reasons. One is we're not that concerned about actually documenting that what we're doing is actually making a difference. Um, I, I meet with you know, startups all the time, and they say things like, you know, our, project, our, our product works to do this, that, or the next thing. And I always say, how do you know? And they say, well, it does. Um, and what I would like us to do is approach this time in American healthcare delivery with the same rigor that we approach developing new drugs. Do the trials, review the data, evaluate it. And let's be honest with ourselves, because I think this isn't just about you know, creating a new industry or growing the industry. This is about actually taking advantage of what I think is a really hard fought, very special moment in the history of American healthcare delivery. And so let's, let's dive a little bit uh, deeper into what's going on at Merck. So about three years ago, the board and the executive committee got together and they said, look, health information technology is changing our industry, it's changing healthcare, and we need to actually develop you know, sort of a strategy in this place. Uh, and we don't necessarily have, uh, some, have what we need to actually do this. Uh, they said that there's actually more data outside of Merck's walls than there is inside of uh, Merck's walls. That is, our customers, in many cases, know more about our products and their real-world efficacy than we do. Um, and so ultimately what they did is they hired me, which is probably a bad decision, um, because I didn't necessarily know anything about the pharmaceutical industry. I do know about healthcare delivery. I did know about healthcare policy. Um, I do know about health information technology. And so what we began on was sort of a journey where we were learning the organization, learning the problems of the industry, and frankly, building a team that I, I think didn't look like a team uh, that sort of normally would exist within a pharma company. We recruited from the ranks of investment banking, from, uh, recruited heavily from uh, some of my former colleagues from HHS. Uh, we looked at clinical medicine. Uh, and we put together a team who was really multidisciplinary in its approach to thinking about the role of health information technology uh, in the industry. 
And we ultimately came up with kind of three core pillars to our strategy, and I want to talk about each of these. One is, you know, what, what John calls big data, and I agree exactly with his characterization. Big data is not that big. Um, it's ultimately how we use that data, and so um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Jacob mentioned the notion of clinical decision support, and I think that we're just beginning to scratch the surface in terms of what we can do to provide actionable insights to clinicians at the point of care to actually drive improvements in care, and we'll, we'll say a little bit about that. And frankly, um, you know, the third, and I think, you know, sometimes the most exciting piece of this is actually getting the voice of the patient into drug development through uh, health information technology. So um, my big question when I walked in the company and everybody said, okay, you're, you know, we're going to build a big data shop here. And I would say, well, what do we want to do with that big data? And so I, we really broke it down into uh, kind of three key categories. One is um, sort of this is, you know, bread and butter uh, sort of, you know, health, health economics and health outcome studies and epidemiology. So studies of comparative effectiveness, safety, efficacy, the natural history of disease and treatment. These things can be enhanced by uses of uh, electronic medical records and health information technology. Um, I think there's sort of a history of, of doing this in a, in a particular way. I think there are, there are new opportunities to actually do this in close collaboration with some of our customers so we can better understand the real world value and efficacy of products. The second is, is, you know, which is actually most exciting to me as a, as a still practicing clinician, is this notion of clinical quality improvement initiatives. The ability to work collaboratively with your customers to understand how your products are working in the real world, and then leverage health information technology and data to enhance how the, those products are used. Um, and then the third is new value-based payment models for our therapies. You know, you can't actually pay for value unless you understand real world value. That's sort of, you know, so there's been a, you know, for 10, 15 years, people have been talking about pay for value. I think the only way that an industry like the pharmaceutical industry can actually get there is through sort of advanced uses of real world data. So this is how we think about this question of, of, of big data. And what we did, you know, to, to actually kickstart this effort was actually build uh, collaborations with world class informatics organizations like the Regan Streif Institute and Maccabi to, to bring our researchers, to bring our epidemiologists, bring our outcomes researchers closer to kind of cutting edge informatics in the real world. And so we work very closely with John Duke at the Regan Streif Institute um, on a series of projects related to um, comparative effectiveness, safety, efficacy, natural history of disease and treatment, and also thinking you know, strategically about how we can actually build new data assets that can help answer questions like what is the real world value of our products? We're linking data sets that didn't, didn't, weren't linked before. We're creating one of the largest repositories of data on the natural history of osteoporosis by linking bone mineral density data to EMR data. These are things that, you know, frankly, haven't been done before. And collaboration ends up being key here because if you're doing, if you're dating, if you're doing sort of one-off projects, you're not going to get the same effects as if you're married. And so we've entered into five-year, you know, marriages uh, with, with uh, the Regan, Regan Streif and, and with Maccabi to try to get to a place where we can actually build new capabilities, build new assets to really advance the science of, of data as it relates to uh, uh, sort of uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, we have a similar relationship with Maccabi. Now, Maccabi, if you're not familiar with them, you know, for those of you who are, um, it, it's really just one of the most exciting places for health services research in the world. Um, the, the Israelis kind of dis kind of recognize that uh, health information technology was important 20 years before we did. And so they've got these 25-year uh, sort of uh, data sets that actually um, are, are very robust because they have zero, almost zero churn. Uh, they have 1% kind of uh, sort of switching in terms of uh, between the four pairs within the, within the country. So when you want to study the natural history of disease and treatment, Maccabi ends up being a really extraordinary place to do that. Um, and now what we're doing, in, in, as we kind of think about next steps for our collaboration, is we're actually bringing Regan Streif together with Maccabi to try to explore some of the potential network effects of working together across geographies and across organizations. And if you're interested in some details on uh, the actual nature of this collaboration, we actually have a paper that came out in JAMA a few weeks ago as an online first um, on you know, whether big data is kind of the new platform for industry academic collaboration, and I'd be happy to talk with you more about that later on. The next, the next space is really this notion of clinical decision support. And one of the things that was kind of most frustrating to me as kind of an ex-student of healthcare quality um, is the notion that we, we develop new drugs, we develop guidelines, and then we look at what's actually happening in practice, and you know, it's, we're frankly you know, 15 and 20 years behind kind of the best of science 
And it surprises people because people think of clinical medicine as being kind of a very forward-thinking, science-driven profession. But when you look at it kind of in the aggregate, we have these huge lags between the development of innovative products and innovative solutions to, to medical problems and their use in the real world. And so, you know, we asked this very basic question, could we use clinical decision support to, to improve outcomes? And so, I'm actually very happy that, you know, this is kind of a neat coincidence. Today, um, we actually just announced our first um, partnership with Practice Fusion, which is really focused on vaccines use. Um, and we're, we look at the problem of adults, adult vaccinations, and we recognize that, you know, the, the rates of adult vaccinations are, are sort of, uh, you know, kind of embarrassing in this country in the 50 to 60 percent range. That means that we have preventable illnesses like, you know, pneumococcal uh, illness and, um, and uh, shingles and herpes zoster that we can prevent, but that we don't prevent because we have a failure to actually deliver the right interventions at the right, right point in time. And so we're working collaboratively with Practice Fusion, which is a vendor that has 100,000 users to actually improve the use of adult vaccinations. We're also working on uh, a similar partnership with all, all scripts and other therapeutic areas, and also working with CE City, which is an in innovative um, medical education company, uh, to, to try to build quality improvement platforms around osteoporosis. The final kind of area of, of work for us is really around patient-facing IT. And, um, you know, we, I think that across the healthcare industry, hospitals, uh, physician offices, uh, pharmaceutical companies, device manufacturers, and government, we do a terrible job of this. We do a terrible job of actually bringing the authentic voice of patients into the room. And, you know, it's, and, and I've thought a lot about this problem. And one of the issues is we oftentimes think of ourselves as the patients. You know, people always say, well, I'm a patient too. But the reality is many of the people that we're trying to serve will never make it into, you know, the executive hallways of a company like Merck or Partners Healthcare or the Beth Israel. Um, they just don't. Uh, if they have the resources to do that, thing, that type of thing, they're probably doing something else with their time. And so, you know, we are thinking creatively about how health information technology can help us to bring the voices of patients, uh, you know, into the room. Now, you would say to me that, you know, that really we're talking about the digital haves who, who in terms of using platforms like Patients Like Me, which is an online community, as well as Smart Patients, which is a new online community focused on osteoporosis. You're saying, you know, we're, 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 we're not necessarily capturing the folks who are not digitally connected. And I would say, yes, you are right. But this is an important first step, I think, in trying to understand what the unmet you know, medical need is. You know, within these sort of large organizations, we, we, we give a lot of lip service to trying to integrate the voice of patients, and we all mean well. But ultimately, you know, in terms of real platforms that actually enable us to do that, we're, you know, we don't have a lot of resources, and we don't have a lot of uh, access to the real patient voice. And so um, we, we think collaborations like the ones that we have with patients like me and, and smart patients, which are in the psoriasis, insomnia, and oncology areas can really begin to make a difference to help us understand how we can do a better job of actually fulfilling, fulfilling our mission. And so, um, you know, it, 2014 was really kind of our, you know, 2013 was our, um, I, I would say 2012 and 2013 were really about kind of building our strategy and our, our set of collaborations. 2014 is, is about executing on these collaborations. Uh, and we now have a robust set of collaborations in these three areas that I'd be happy to talk with you, with you all about. Um, and so I just want to leave you with this image of, of the iPod. Um, this is an old one, not, a, not, not sort of uh, the latest generation iPod. But, you know, when, when you talk about sort of uh, the drug development business or you talk about healthcare delivery, you know, we're really in the songwriting business. That's ultimately what it is. We're trying to make, we're trying to write some hits. Um, we're trying to have some hits that are used by a lot of people, that are enjoyed by a lot of people, that make people's lives better. But ultimately, this sort of, you know, how you actually deliver those hits to people actually matters. And so this notion of, you know, innovating the delivery mechanism and innovating the information around the vaccines and around the pills, I think is actually increasingly important as we recognize, you know, the gaps in translation. You know, we, we, we're a company that's developed a vaccination that prevents cancer. 30 years ago, that would, be, that would have been seen as total science fiction, um, a vaccine that actually prevents the development and progression to cancer. Yet, somehow 50% of Americans don't actually have access to the benefits of that vaccine. And so we have to think more about the delivery mechanisms. We have to think more about the information that goes around the interventions. We have to think about the iPods. And so um, that's the work of our group, and uh, we're very excited about it, and uh, I'm happy to share it with you all uh, today. So look forward to engaging with you in the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you.